like you to stand and respond with me and recite this one more time as we prepare to read our text this morning from Acts chapter 21. These words, I had to look it up because I memorized them in a different version. For a time is coming and has now come. Uh, <clears throat> in spirit and in truth. They are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. Worship in spirit and in truth. Um, 4, 23, 24. That's a little bit of a, a key to the text we're about to read. One of the things that it gives us is a kind of working definition of worship, the kind of essential worship that we're engaged in. We worship in spirit and in truth. But understanding what the Spirit is saying to us can sometimes be difficult. Can I get a witness? Amen. How do you like my voice today? <laughs> I want to read from chapter 21 of the book of Acts. Luke, the gospel storyteller, is giving us a history of the early church and its movement through the expansion of the gospel. But I have to give you some of the backstory. It started in chapter 16 of the book of Acts, verse 6, where they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the word in Asia. That's actually Turkey, modern-day Turkey. And they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't allow them. That's really odd. In other words, the Spirit sometimes says no, not just yes. Cults don't do this. Only God's movement says yes or no, depending on what the situation requires. And then in chapter 19, Paul and his traveling companions begin to minister in a place called Ephesus. It's a wonderful time of fruitful ministry. For some three months, he teaches about Jesus the Christ in the local synagogue, and then he gets kicked out. This is a pattern with Apostle Paul. He gets kicked out and then a riot ensues. He teaches for another two years just down the road at the hall of Tyrannus. And then a riot ensues and for two hours the Ephesians shout in unison, led by Demetrius the silversmith, they shout in unison, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Why is that in our Bible? Well, Demetrius the silversmith had gained no little um, line of living by making silver shrines to Artemis, the god of the Ephesians. You get to under, understand what's going on here. They're cutting into his profit margin, and so they start a riot. The Apostle Paul finally is leaving, in chapter 20, the city of Ephesus, and the elders of the church in Ephesus meet him, on the beach, they have a final prayer meeting. And Paul says in chapter 20, verse 22, and now as a captive to the spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and persecutions are waiting for me. But I do not count my life of any course and the ministry that I have finished from the Lord Jesus. I only wanna finish my course to testify to the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of God's grace. And that's where we pick up verse, 20, or verse 1 of chapter 21. When we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Herodes, and from there to Patara. We then found a ship bound for Phoenicia. We went on board and set sail. We came in sight of Cyprus, and leaving it on our left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, where, because the ship was to unload its cargo there. We looked up the disciples and stayed there for seven days. Through the Spirit, they told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. You get the understanding? Paul says, I'm captive of the Spirit, and I'm on my way to Jerusalem. Now these people in the church in Tyre filled with the Holy Spirit, say to him, no, don't go to Jerusalem. That's a problem. 
When our days there were ended, we left and proceeded on our journey, and all of them, both wives and children, escorted us outside the city. We knelt down on the beach and prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and we greeted the believers and stayed with them for one day. The next day we came, we left and came to Caesarea, and we went into the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. That's obvious. They were unmarried. They could see what was about to happen. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. While they were staying there for several days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us and took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands with it, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is the way the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Since he would not be persuaded, we remain silent except to say, The Lord's will be done. This, brothers and sisters, is the will of God or the word of God, and it's kind of weird. We've got spirit-filled people on both sides of the equation. Some say, Paul, you ought not go to Jerusalem. Paul says, I'm filled with the Spirit, and I have to go to Jerusalem. Doesn't that seem a little odd to you? I assumed that the people of God, led by the Spirit of God, empowered by the Spirit, fulfilled the will of God by doing what God tells them. And now these people, Spirit-filled, Spirit-guided, seem to have a very different opinion about what should happen. Thanks be to God. Where two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, there are at least four opinions present. <laughs> Amen. You can be seated. That is a weird passage of Scripture. I don't really know what's going on. It, it seems a little bit odd to me that empowered by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, guided by the Spirit, you would expect the very question about this text seems to indicate that the real assumption is that everybody will be told the same thing if they're given a message from the Spirit of God, right? Doesn't it make sense that if we're following the Spirit of God and God wants to lead and guide God's people, that the people can count on the fact that God will say, the right thing at the right time in the right way, and everybody will get the same message. But that doesn't always work, does it? In fact, the odd thing about this text of ours is that the narrator of this story, Luke, who's been writing for us so patiently and so faithfully, Luke makes no attempt whatsoever to reconcile these two divergent opinions about what Paul should do. He's perfectly fine just letting it lay there, as if to say, maybe that's not the way it's done, that sometimes the Holy Spirit of God can be at work in the church, and the people of God will have to struggle and even have difficult times when they have differing opinions about what needs to be done. Have you ever seen that happen in a local church? Have you ever seen that happen in the society around us? We're in one of those weird seasons of election, indifference of opinion. We hear all about it on every side. Who will win? Who will lose? Well, the future of our country depends upon it, they tell us. I want to say, you know, I'm not so sure that you need to get really uptight about this. God's been working with this kind of difficulty for a few years now. And I think the Lord can be counted on to redeem and work with us no matter what the outcomes might be. It does matter intensely what we decide to do. We're told to live as people of Jesus Christ, live as people of faith, and to follow the dictates of our conscience as led and influenced by the Holy Spirit of God. But sometimes 
we just don't come to final unity of agreement on every point. And that's a difficulty. I, I look around and wonder, what are we going to do with this? How are you going to handle this intractable impasse? When everybody doesn't have the same opinion, what are you going to do? I, I listen to the political realm, and I realize the, there's a long history here, and they'll be just fine one way or the other. The reality is they make their living on opposing one another, right? I remember reading about Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of uh, the United Kingdom. He was invited during his years in office to a dinner with a, a home, the, the family of one of his political adversaries. He decided he would do it nonetheless, and that was the kind of political leader he was. He was going to serve everybody. He went to the home of his political adversary. And after a nice, lovely dinner, the wife, the hostess of the gathering, was pouring the tea, and she said, Mr. Churchill, if you were my husband, I would poison your tea. And he, without missing a beat, said, Madam, if you were my wife, I would drink it. <laughs> you know, so maybe that's what we need to do. We just need to relax a little bit and understand that there will be some disagreements, some differences of opinion that we won't fully resolve. Well, that's okay, but I still want to say a word about the unity of the Church of Jesus Christ. I want to get along with the people with whom I worship, these worship essentials, and there are moments when I'm just not quite sure. See, one of the problems I have, you're probably different than me, but I've noticed that there can be about me a kind of persistent stubbornness that I'm convinced of the rightness of my predictable and preferable opinions. Are you different than me? And I just dig in, and I won't give for anybody. I, I, have, I have a spiritual gift. It's the spiritual gift of immaculate perception. I know how God sees things on a really good day, and, and God has let me know. And, and, and so I, I begin to impose that on the people all around me. I've been a pastor a long time, you know, over four decades. And, and in that time, do you know, as pastor of large churches here and there, I've had the occasion on multiple times when I've been working with families to make the final arrangements, the... the the wonderful arrangements for their deceased. And we're picking through the songs and the titles that we will use in the memorial service. And I've had two families say to me in that setting, well, we want to close the service with his two favorite songs. What are they, I ask? Oh, they say the favorite songs that he always had during his life. The first is Amazing Grace. Well, I've heard of that one. And the second is, I did it my way. <laughs> and it never occurred to them in the moment that the fundamental messages of those two songs were diametrically opposed. Why is it? I think they're just stubborn. They were persistent. They believed in the rightness of their opinions. They had the spiritual gift of immaculate perception. The hard truth is, you know, that, that can hurt somebody. If we are lacking in humility about our ideas and our perceptions, we can actually harm and injure others around us. We lose sight of the essential humanness of the relationships that we've tried to establish and support and, and maintain in our daily worship as living sacrifices. That's important. I, I, I want not to injure somebody. And Paul seems to understand this as well. Look again at verse 13 in chapter 21. Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? Do you understand? He, he's zeroed in, focused on the essential human relationship that's being held and carried between these people. They have different opinions about the Spirit's guidance, to be sure, but that is no excuse for unleashing 
righteousness on one another. I remember William Barclay, who was a great biblical scholar, and earlier in my career when he was still alive, William Barclay wrote his spiritual autobiography. He talked about the time when his 21-year-old daughter and her fiance were caught in a storm out on a boat, and in the ravages of the storm, they were actually drowned in the boating accident. It was a terrible time of loss for Barkley and his wife. 21-year-old daughter had died, her fiance had died, and what made it even worse was that after her death, Barkley received letters, anonymous letters, from fellow Christians, some of whom had the spiritual gift of immaculate perception, perhaps. And as one woman put it in her letter, I know why God took your daughter. Really? She said, yes, God took your daughter so that she would be spared the corruption that would come by paying attention to your teaching and heresies. That hurts, doesn't it? You know, I've been a pastor long enough to have learned this. It's entirely difficult to be right about something without hurting somebody with it. Do you know what I'm talking about? The relationships and families, choices that others make. I, I want to ask a, a question. Is it really our responsibility to impose on somebody else our idea of what they need to do to follow the Lord. It seems to me that there is a division of labor. My job is to always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within me. And Timothy tells me that in his epistle, in the epistle of Paul to Timothy. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. It's the job of the Holy Spirit to provoke the question to raise the question in the life of those that I'm living with. Why and how do you live the way you do? I want to live in such a fashion to demonstrate a little bit of humility. That may require at times some compassion or at least, at least some caution. That I need to be careful about the way I speak about the will of the Lord. Now, I'm not in any way advocating that we swallow the truth about what we've come to know in Jesus Christ. I'm just saying that there might be something that we need to remember, that these are people who belong to God ultimately, not to us. You know, it would have been nice to have a really loud amen at that point. But I'm working on it. And so, you know, I, I think one of the things we might want to look at here again, is, is how the Apostle Paul responds to this division of opinion, diverse opinions between the people of the church in Tyre and Paul himself, all of whom are said to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. I, uh, I ran into somebody that caught my attention a few years ago, Dr. Kate Bowler, who teaches at Duke Divinity School. I, I remember when she started her academic career, she was teaching about the prosperity gospel and the churches that had risen to proclaim the prosperity God's gospel, which means that, you know, God loves me and so God wants to bless me. I believe there's a truth there, but I think you have to be really careful about it. Kate Bowler said she had just finished her doctoral degree, finished her dissertation, and then she got an unwelcome cancer diagnosis, stage four cancer. She'd just given birth to her first child. And now, at the beginning of her academic career, at the beginning of her family life, she was being told that she was stage four cancer. She said all my friends went into action. She wrote a book about it. I love the book. The book is entitled, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. She said, all my intellectual friends, they were trying to Google my diagnosis and they were trying to figure out if I could outthink cancer. 
She said all my hippie friends, uh, they were trying to ask me if I wanted a recipe for the really healthy kale salad that maybe I could eat my way out of cancer. And she said the others, the prosperity gospel people that I'd been researching while writing my dissertation, they kept saying to me, I can positively declare that cancer has no power over me and set myself free. But listen to what she wrote. She said, it's very bizarre to be eclipsed by a disease you barely knew existed a couple months before. I'm one of the many people who wants to have an answer where there is no answer, who wants to demand things of God when God does not always connect the dots. And I'm not very theologically declarative, she said. I've tried to hold off on doing that in order to make space for people to make up their own minds. But in case I was a lot more, in this case, it was a lot more personal. I don't have a lot of pretension anymore. She said, I've been thinking about my career, comparing evangelical congregations and prosperity megachurches. They're almost indistinguishable. There are constant celebrations, the same emotional arc in all their worship music. Everything has to lead to happy at all times, but the desire to make things palatable and shiny and cheerful needs to be resisted. Not that everyone needs to have a blue, blue Christmas, but people, listen, she says, people think need to have a thick language of authentic pain in order to grapple with the reality of life. Jesus dying for my sins is fundamental to my salvation, she said. But that's actually not what I need to hear right now. What I need to hear about is the breaking in of the kingdom of God. Because it has to be about more than me and my sin, right? It has to be about the transformation of the world. It has to be a story in which my family gets to go back together again after I die and go to heaven. That's actually wonderful, but people who die are not necessarily worried about dying. They're worried about the people they're leaving behind. So she said, my only prayer for this cancer is that somehow it makes me more of God intended me to be. I mean, that I could be somehow more of myself than I would have been without it. She's asking a sanctification question. God, will you do in me what you need to do so that I can do for you whatever you ask? That's an important orientation in life. I think in the end, we're going to have to get over some magical thinking. I'm borrowing that phrase from Joan Didion, a wonderful writer before her death. She talked about magical thinking. In the Christian community, it works this way. We don't always get exactly what we want when we're praying, right? And we don't always know what God might be doing at any given moment because it can be confusing. And sometimes we struggle to find an answer that orients our life and our journey. Sometimes we're just not sure. But the magical thinking approach is that we keep looking for the right formula and the winning strategy. We keep thinking that if we're doing it the right way, if we're praying about the right things, that everything will be all right. Let me tell you, I don't think that's exactly what God is doing. When I was a doctoral student at Princeton Seminary, Craig Barnes was the president of that place, and I, I grew and learned a lot from his teaching. Listen to what he had to say. He said, the Lord's will be done. Sometimes that's distorted to have a kind of deterministic edge about it, that God's will will be manifest in our actions, that we will automatically do God's will. I think just the opposite is actually true, he says. I think the will of God is to make us free, free to choose because that's what the Holy Spirit is all about. You see, the work of the Holy Spirit is not to give us certainty about directions. The work of the Holy Spirit is to draw us into Jesus Christ, the risen and ascended Christ, to adopt us into the Son's own beloved relationship with the Father. That's the work of the Spirit. 
And then that creates tremendous freedom in our lives. If it is in fact the will of God to draw us home to God, then we're free to choose without any anxiety that we could possibly choose our way outside the will of God, the love of God. He's absolutely right. I mean, God doesn't worry in heaven. Will Paul go to Jerusalem or not go to Jerusalem? Boy, I sure hope he does the right choice because if he makes the wrong choice, I won't be able to be with him. That's not what God says. So Craig says, the Holy Spirit is focused on making you a free person. That's what the will of God is primarily about, to make you free as you were created to be. To be filled with the Spirit means to return to the dignity that you were created with at the very beginning. A person who was made in the image of God, a God who willed you to not be on your own in life, a God who willed you to be more than dust, more than a sinner, a God who wills forgiveness for you, a God who grants gracious reconciliation, a God who wills that you be restored to be fully alive. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Paul says. He seems to understand that. He says, I'm willing to even be bound even to death for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, this is bigger than me getting what I want. What I really want is for God to be manifest and glorified in what I do, what I choose, where I go, and who I will be. I, uh, I've been thinking about this a lot this week. I had kind of a, a moment to do that. I, uh, I celebrated a birthday this week. You can commiserate with me later. But in that birthday, I sat and was thinking about the decisions I've made whether they were the right ones, whether I went the right way or the wrong way, what I could still do to honor and glorify the Lord. I remember having a prayer retreat a long time ago, back in a place called Kansas City where we were living at the time. I, I told Carmen, I'm gonna go off for three days and I'm gonna fast and I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna read the scriptures. That's all I'm gonna take with me is my Bible. It sounded very religious. I was very impressed with myself. <laughs> and I went down to a conference center where I taught and I rented a room. And I went into the room and I had my prayer list and my Bible and I read my Bible and then I got out my prayer list and I was pretty much done in about 20 minutes. You know, I'd covered everything that I'd thought was important, seemed right. Now it's God's job to give me an answer. The only answer I'd been receiving was over the course of several months, it seemed that God was saying, get ready to go. Get ready to go. I, I didn't want to hear that. I wanted to stay where I was serving for the Lord for the rest of my career. That's what I had in mind. But the answer kept coming back, get ready to go. I said to God, well, you know, you've been telling me, it seems, get ready to go, but it, I'm now believing that maybe that was just about me and what I was thinking. So you've not told me exactly where I would go and what kind of certainty I should have in making a decision. So I, I'm, prepared to believe that maybe that was just about me and I was confusing myself. And later that afternoon, I called Carmen. I said, hey, how, how are you doing? She said, I thought you were on a silent retreat. <laughs> what are you doing calling me? I said, what are you going to have for dinner? She said, leftovers. <laughs> I said, you had me at hello. I, I'm not getting anywhere. This doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know where God wants us to go. God's been telling me, get ready to go, but God hasn't told me where to go. I'm coming home. You know, it's, uh, it takes a real man to go home for leftovers with your tail between your legs. And I was driving down the highway 
And I was complaining to the Lord, Lord, you, you haven't told me anything with certainty. I need to know for sure where you're leading me. And just that moment, one of those late model sports cars came whizzing by me and it had a personalized license plate. And of all the things that Jaybird could have put on his license plate, what it said was, ready to go. <laughs> could you just make it clear? <laughs> I don't know about that. I got to thinking, it didn't come clear immediately. If you're addicted to results, you probably will lose interest in praying pretty quickly. Because sometimes God is cultivating a relationship with you. Prayer is not primarily the means of acquisition in your life. It's about gaining receptivity and the Lord revealing God's purposes and in the process creating a new community around you so that you have a place to believe and to serve with other people who honor and respect the same thing. Barry Boulware came to my attention when I was living in Kansas City. He said he was reaching a point where he needed a decision too. So he went into a sanctuary, went down to the altar and filled out a piece of paper and listed all the things he would give to God, all the things he would do for God, all the things that he would commit to God if God would just lead him, guide him, direct him. Then he signed his name on it and put it on the altar and went back to his seat in the sanctuary. He said, I began to hear another voice. It seemed to be the Lord's voice. After a few minutes, it seemed very clear to me that I'd done it wrong. And the Lord seemed to say, get up, go down to the altar, get another piece of paper. I'll show you what to do. And when he did, the Lord seemed to say, just sign your name on it, and then let me fill in all the rest. That'll work. I said, that'll work. The Lord be with you. The Spirit fill you. And may God direct you. Amen. Amen. Hey, we're going to close in a very appropriate way. We're going to close with the celebration of communion. You have been so gracious to put up with my voice again. But... Uh, Today, as we partake of these elements and the worship team comes and the servers prepare to serve you, I, I just want to point out something. In the New Testament, whenever Jesus is feeding a crowd, whenever Jesus is serving the communion elements, he does the same thing. The, the scriptures use the same words, four verbs, four verbal phrases. Jesus takes the elements, and then he blesses the elements, and then he breaks what he takes, and then he gives it away. That really is the sacrificial life, the life of worship essentials. Jesus lays claim to your life. He'll take what you give him. The good news is he'll always bless what he takes. If you give it to him, he'll bless it. I'm sorry to tell you this, but he might have to break it apart. It won't stay the same for you. It may end up looking different to you in some way. But in the end, he does all of that so that he can give you away to the people around you in the name of Jesus Christ. So we read in the scriptures, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it, broke it gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup after supper, he gave it to his friends and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. 
and proclaim the power of the Lord's death till he comes again. Amen. Hey church family, thank you so much for watching this video. We hope that God is inspiring you and working in your life. If so, make sure you send this video to a friend so that they can be impacted by the good news of the gospel as well. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss a single video. And as always, we hope that God is continuing to work and move in your life. Thanks again for watching. God bless.